My life could end today. I'm not guaranteed another breath. God determines whether he's going to give me another breath. He, he determines whether I make it through this interview. He's the author of life. And I don't feel any right to take life. And none of us should. Thank you, Francis Chan, for coming and sitting down and talking. Anytime. This is great. There are a lot of fans of yours on the live action team. <laughs> it's, it's always weird to hear that about anything, just because I know me. Well, <laughs> you know you, but I think they're seeing your love for God. Yeah. And the way yes. you're expressing that. So, And that's why I'm also really excited you're sitting down here. We've had some other pastors and you know we're going to be having other bishops and folks sit yeah. down. And it takes courage today. Mm. which in and of itself is kind of a tragedy uh, that people would need to have this push to even sit down to talk about life. Yeah, yeah. God's children. Well, I think it's, it's weird because it's been you know, somewhat easy for a few decades, and now we're in a season where everyone is so volatile. Mm -hmm. And so to just speak openly and clearly and unashamedly of, well, this is the best I can understand the Bible, and to just say it outright, it's terrifying for people today. But this is what we're called to do, mm. to be sensitive and to love, but to not be afraid or to shrink back mm. from saying, you know, here's what the scriptures say. Mm. So I want to get into all of those things yeah. uh, on life and faith and yeah. everything. But starting back from the beginning, yeah. young, young okay. Francis Chan, um, when did you first? When did you first have an awareness of God? You know, it's interesting. I um, so I was when I was born, my mother died giving birth to me, so in San Francisco, and so then my dad didn't want me, and so he gave me up for adoption and. And it was my grandmother and aunt that fought. And, you know, after he already was giving me over to some lady, they took me away and took me to Hong Kong. And, you know, my earliest memory, I was probably four or five, was being in Hong Kong in a temple because my grandparents were Buddhists and staring at these like statues and trying to talk to them and staring at their mouths like really believing they could talk back to me. So when you say awareness of God, I, I remember as a kid just thinking there's something more. And so that's my earliest life memory is sitting in a temple, staring at statues, hoping for a response as I spoke to them in Chinese. And then uh, came back to the States at five, my dad was remarried, um, stepmom, and then she died. Car accident when I was at seven or eight. Mm. Then my dad got married again. Then he died when I was 12. And I remember just asking my brother, like, what happens when we die? Like, I would have like these scary thoughts at night after seeing, because we did the open casket mm. thing. And so, here I am staring at my stepmother as a seven-year-old and watching her body go on the ground. And then here I am, it's 12-year-old, staring at my dad as he's going on the ground. And you just go to bed with these thoughts and these images. And I think that's where the hunger came from. Like, I need to know what happens after this. And we had been to church, but I didn't understand it. It's Chinese church. And then um, in high school, some friends invited me to a youth group and, and I was challenged to study the Bible for myself and to read it. And that's when I really began praying and watching God miraculously answer my prayers. How? What did that look like? My, my, I remember my youth pastor would say like, when you pray something, write it down. I want you to keep a journal because you're going to see how he answers all those prayers. And then on the other side, write the date that it's answered. And so I did, you know, just in faith. And I, 
I probably still have that journal somewhere, you know, with all the. What books. were you praying for? Um, I would remember? pray. Yeah, I remember like my first one was, you know, because when I believed, I mean, I believed and I, I don't know, just something hit me like, no, this is true. Like, I really believe that I am forgiven by what Christ did on the cross. I really, something inside me tells me that it doesn't just end, you know, kind of like Solomon, you know, when he says like eternity is in our hearts, like that's why I asked my brother, like, do we just end? I don't get it. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, everything ends. And I'm like, that's not right. You know, like I, I knew somehow, like, no, there's, there's more to it. And I didn't know it until I would look at the scriptures and go, wow, now the scriptures actually say there's no end. And, and I had a sense, like, I'm not just this random accident like they tell me at school. Like there's something more to this. It didn't make sense to me. Like we're living on this planet. I, I'd be fascinated. Like, wow, we're living on this earth that's spinning at a thousand miles an hour. And that's crazy. And it's flying around a ball of fire at, at what, 67,000 miles an hour. And it's 90 million miles away. And here I am laughing. I'm crying. I'm feeling all of this. And it's just, it came from nothing. It just never resonated with me. And so I had this awareness, but then when I understood that this God loved me and wanted relationship with me and sent his son to die to make that happen, and now I could be forgiven through my faith in him and he'd put his spirit in me and I'd have a relationship with my creator. I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. Let me, in a sense, try, you know, I mean, I believed it, but let me try these prayers. And I, I believe, I remember the first one I prayed about was I used to go to, there was a park next to our church and I'd go play basketball in hopes of building a relationship. Mm. And I remember meeting a couple of guys one week. And so that was the first thing on my journal. I so remember one guy's name was Squeaky. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say, God, I just want to share the gospel with Squeaky. Give me an opportunity to make mm. something happen. And, and sure enough, the very next week, uh, when we're in our youth group, we hear all this screaming and swearing downstairs and and there's about to be a fight, you know. I grew up in Stockton, so what was it? It was a church in a school building or no, it was just a church and then next door was a park, but for some reason they were in the church parking lot. And I didn't know what it was. Oh. I kind of walk outside and it's a fight that's about to break out. There's probably like 10 people, and there's one guy in the middle, like ready to take them all on, and they're swearing, da 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 da. And I look and I'm like, it's squeaky. <laughs> you know? He needs and, to be in church with yeah, me right no, now. No, <laughs> that's exactly. I went downstairs. I'm like, squeaky, what are you doing? And they're like, there, you know, effing this, 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 this. And I'm like, dude, there's 10 of them. I go, look, first of all, just come with me. Okay, this is crazy. You're not going to get into a fight in a church parking lot. You know, I'm like 15 years old at this time. I just come up with me. You know, and I think he kind of wanted to get out of it anyways, you know. So I just pulled him out and we went upstairs. He sat in this youth group, gave his life to the Lord. We become friends. You know, so it was, it was those types of prayers mm. that here's something on the left. Here's the answer. Mm. Here's, you know, where God was listening to me. Mm. And it's been 40 years of that. Times when it's. It's almost scary. He really hears everything I say to him. Like he is watching me right now. And he knows my thoughts. He knows my heart. He knows if I'm trying to make myself look good. If I'm trying to just lift him up. Like it's become just this deep, deep 40 year love relationship. <laughs> it's best I could describe it, I guess. And I love him more and I'm closer to him now and desire to know him more. 
than I ever have. Mm. It's been an amazing journey. I was listening to a talk recently for something called the Good News Conference okay. by a friend named okay. Chris Stefanik. Okay. And he's a speaker. And he was talking about how the, the thing that just entrances people, and it, you have this, you're speaking it right now. And I know oh. people watching are like, what does that guy have? Because I want mm. this. You want mm. some of this. And you're talking about your love relationship yeah. with God. And the word Chris used for it in the speech at this conference was joy, mm. the joy of the Lord. Mm. And the joy of the Lord is something that is talked about in both the Old and New Testament. Yeah. But it's this, this exo exhilaration that comes from the deepest recesses because yeah. you know you're loved. Yes. And you know that you can love. Yes. And you know that you're alive with love. Yeah. And, and it's like, that's life and it's full, right? Yeah. That's life in full. And so there's joy. And I think that comes, you know, that's so close to the conversation we're going to have today about abortion and the culture and the mm. faith because, you know, we're dealing with dark times. Mm. And time has always been dark since the garden. Mm. But yeah. we're dealing with dark times. And in darkness, yeah. there's, it's a lack of joy, ultimately. Yeah. People have, people are suffering. Yeah. And and that's why I think before we even get into those mm -hmm. those topics, at the foundation, it's about knowing who made you and then the thrill of wow, he's listening to me, he hears me, like this is this is outrageous. I mean, crazy. I, I could sit here for hours and just tell you story after story of just I mean, the Bible talks about how we should possess this joy inexpressible. And that really is what he's brought into my life. And this isn't like, oh, because I had such a great childhood and everything was so easy and that's my natural disposition. I mean, my earliest memories are just, I, I was that depressed kid. I was that no one wants me on the earth. No one wants me alive. My own family doesn't want me. They're forced to take me back, you know, because my grandma couldn't take me, but they didn't want me. And, and, and so the way my father, we never had a single conversation. Um, he just beat me like ridiculously, tie me to a tree, just go after me with branches. And I mean, this was my upbringing. And, and I just remember things that my aunt would say, like, why are you never happy? Or, you know, my dad just saying, you always have that look on your face. And, you know, that was just who I was. And the change, the shift of this peace and security and being loved and being overwhelmed, like, I can't believe how close I am to Creator God. This is outrageous. That's at the foundation of my life. When did you have that first experience of being loved? Mm. Well, you know, I, I, I confess this to my church a few weeks ago even. I go, you know, it's a, it's a process. Mm -hmm. Like, I still wrestle. You know, there's, there's certain passages in the Bible that talk about God's holiness and his grandeur and just how we need to fear him. And then there's other passages talking about him being a God of grace and mercy and how we can come near to the throne of grace. And I wrestle with those, you know, because the thought of coming before that terrifying God and he's telling me to draw near and to be one with him. For those of us that grew up and didn't have that relationship with a father, it's like, I have to take your word for it, but this is really awkward. Um, but as far as being loved, I, I really feel like I didn't become secure in anyone's love probably till a few years into marriage. Mm. You know, my wife was just, she clearly loves me. Mm. And it's been 29 years now, and seven kids and four grandkids. And I mean, at her 25 years, she, you know, we're having dinner and she just mm -hmm. looks at me. She goes, do you know anyone happier than us? And I go, honestly, I don't. Wow. She goes, me neither. 
but she goes, I keep thinking I'll meet someone that's more blessed. Or okay, we got to talk about that for a minute. <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, actually, I was going to ask you at some point if we yeah. had time, your love story with your wife. Yeah. But let's cut right to that. Yeah. People hearing that, I mean, yeah. everyone wants a happy marriage. Oh, yeah. Most people want to get married, or if they don't want to get married, it's because they think marriage is going to make you unhappy. Yes. Right? Because they've yeah. seen bad marriages yeah, or divorces, yeah, yeah. and, you know, there's just, it, it's kind of chaos out there in the dating world and in the marriage world, the divorce yeah. rate, you know, oh. potentially 50%-ish. Totally. What are the secrets to, how did you guys get so happy? I know what my kids would say is, Dad is never serious except when he's talking about God. Mm. You know, everything else is fair game to laugh at, mm. make fun of. I mean, it's just, there's so much laughter in our home. Like, yeah, my wife, we joke about it. She's not funny. Mm. Like, she just, <laughs> just doesn't have that. You, you know, we, we, but she loves to laugh. And she, so she laughs at the jokes and you tell her. Oh, yeah, them and we okay. laugh at her. There is the jokes. secret yes, <laughs> to yes, the happy yes. marriage. I mean, laughter covers a lot of there conflict. There is. Well, um, and I would also so, say. Or resolves it even. Yeah, we're on a mission together. Mm, like, that's, we don't put our marriage first. Honestly, we just go, okay, we're on the earth to accomplish something. You know, we, we're here to glorify God. We're here to feed the poor. We're here to kind of rescue people that are in danger. We're here to just explain how good it is to follow God. Mm -hmm. And so if people need a place to live, our house has always been open. We've always had strangers living with us for the last 30 years. And, and some of those don't end well, but we just keep going for it. Like our money goes to the needs around the world. We just committed to a simple life and go, we don't need stuff to be happy. And so even when we came into money, I go, we're not touching any of it. Let's, let's go, let's go build hospitals, let's build schools, let's do whatever we can, but we're happy. So let's not spend it on us. And so this has just been our mindset. And I tell people, focusing on what you believe God's called you to do as a couple it's like the byproduct of that has been our unity and our love and our family. Like, I don't know a family that loves being with each other more mm. than ours does. Mm. I mean, and it's just, they're over all the time, the grandkids, everyone. It's just like my son-in-laws are my best friends. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, we really try to put, God's law as sacred, his commands, and believe in them. And I've been faithful to my wife for 30 years because I see what the scriptures say. And that's the way it ought to be. And, and the Bible says his commands lead to life. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, you know, I think in high school, I was like, oh, I hate these commands. But over time, you start realizing, wait, his commands really do lead mm. to life. And so even as a high schooler, gravitating to the word of God and saying, I'm going to keep myself pure for marriage. And my wife having made the same commitment, and we didn't know each other. And so when we met, there was just a lot of commonality that, okay, this, this Bible is going to be at the mm. center. And we believe these commands are going to lead us to life. And and I think that was one of the first mm. gifts I gave to her was a Bible and just wrote some things in there, you know, and I think I put her, her new name, Lisa Chan, on, <laughs> you know, when we we're engaged mm. or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and it was just this whole idea of let's, let's keep him at the center. And mm. there's just too many things that are, you can't make happen mm -hmm. in life. Mm. And you're just dependent on the grace of God. And the greatest things in life aren't things you really mm. planned out um, and fought for and did for yourself. Mm. The thing, I mean, even the relationship itself, it just is like God orchestrated that. What do you say to the young person who's listening who, you know, you talked about the rules, yeah. the law, and, you know, the, one of the fundamental commandments is do not kill, thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. And that's not just 
a religious belief for Christians. It's for Judaism and it's mm -hmm. for Islam and it's for really for people all over the world, different cultures is murder is wrong. And right. Yeah. So the pro-life argument is it's wrong to kill a child in the womb. Mm -hmm. No matter your professed worldview or your religion, it's wrong because you can, you just ask them, is it okay to kill an innocent person? They'll say no. Yeah. Well, that's what abortion does. So it's wrong. But that aside, if there's someone listening and they're like a young person and they yeah. say, okay, I want to live by the rules, especially about sexuality, because mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, the elephant in the room, few people talk about, we talk about it at live action. And the reason we have the abortion crisis is because we have a sex crisis, which is an identity yes. crisis. Yes. And yes. so we have people who are just so confused and we don't, marriage doesn't, sex isn't marriage anymore, right? It's sort of around it. You yes, live together yes, before yes. marriage. And people even say in our culture, it's prudent to live together before marriage to figure yeah. out if you're compatible. Mm. And so what would you say to the young person who may be listening, who is trying very hard mm. to live by the law mm. in, in terms of obey God's plan yeah. for sex and, and, yeah. and, and sexuality, but they're still suffering. You know, maybe it's, you know, yeah. the the delay of their hope to be married one yes. day and they haven't found their spouse oh. or, you know, it's any number of things that yeah. life isn't working out the way yes. they had hoped. Yes. What do you say to them? Well, I, this, this. So the joy book, of the Lord feels yeah. like a struggle for them right it, now. It is. And I remember going through that when I was single, like, gosh, you know, I have this vision of this marriage I want to have and mm. that one hasn't come yet and there's so many you know broken relationships and and i think maybe i was even more hungry because i just never had family and so it's like gosh i want this and i remember i'd go in and out of my contentment like oh no god's enough and then you know friday night rolls around it's like this is alone this again is terrible <laughs> you know got another wedding invitation from another friend you know and it's like oh i'm real happy for you it's it's just it's real and i i will say that the scriptures don't promise um i mean i'm i've i've lived a very blessed life mm -hmm. but this book is filled with people who have lived very difficult lives and yet found blessing amidst it because this relationship with God was so huge to them that even in the suffering and everything else, it like overshadows it. Um, like best illustration I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, when I, when I was single, I, I had this convertible Mustang that I just bought. And, uh, and then I met, you know, my future wife, like weeks later. And, but I loved my car and, and I accidentally ran it into a pole. And normally I would be like uh, devastated, but I didn't care. <laughs> you know, it was like, I'm dating Lisa. I can't believe she's still going out with it. Like there's a love relationship that goes beyond the things that hurt. Mm -hmm. And so it's this connection with the creator and this oneness and this life you can have in him. Mm -hmm. But we get easily distracted and our minds can go to what we don't have. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a wrestle to fight for that. Um, I, I will say it's also very difficult in this day and age because how far we've come from the mm. biblical morality and which uh, Matthew 24, 12 says that about the last days that there'll be an mm. increase in lawlessness. Mm. And so the love of many will grow cold. Mm. So there's gonna be a great increase in saying, let's just throw this all away. Mm. And I was in Israel a few months ago with my 18 year old and 17 year old, cause they were both, one was going to Africa, one was going to the Middle East. And I'm like, okay, I want one last time with you guys. I wanna take you to the Holy Land. I wanna stand there with you. I wanna show you, this is a real place. This is not Wakanda. This is like a real place we can jump on a plane and go to. And, and we're standing on the Mount of Olives, mm -hmm. right? And I go, look, this is where Jesus ascended. and. And uh, we had already been through like Hezekiah's tunnel and we're looking back at Jerusalem and 
And we've been studying like、mm. six thousand years of human history that we just walked、mm. through in these very real places. Like this is where this is where、uh, Abraham took、mm. Isaac right up that、mm. same hill. This is where David, you know, built his palace and had his sin with Bathsheba. This is where Solomon built a temple, and on and on and on. And we walked through a three thousand year tunnel right there. This is where Jesus was crucified. This is where he stood.、Mm. On and on, and there's been one truth that's been passed down for six thousand years. Okay, now you're going to be so tempted because your friend will come up with a new thought that contradicts this, and it'll be tempting to follow him. And I go, but I want you to think about that. You're gonna follow your 18-year-old friend's opinion and thought that he just came up with, that goes against 6,000 years of biblical history. So they're all wrong, and your 18-year-old friend, you know, has this insight because of all those years of Fortnite. You know, he he gets it. Or I go, you guys, think this through. Well, what you're saying is you got to know your history. Yes. You got to know where you came from because、yes. it's so easy to get big-headed、yes. and think that you have all these original thoughts when、totally. you know nothing is new under the sun, including heresies, including、yes. bad ideology.、Yes. The bad ideologies of today that you know make say abortions okay,、yes. killing a child. That say men can be men, women、yeah. and women can be men. You know the body、yeah. doesn't really matter.、Yeah. It's just like this kind of soul, like Gnosticism. There's there's、mm-hmm. actually heresies. Uh, and ideologies, bad ideologies that today's mirror or、mm-hmm. mimic, and they don't、True. even know it.、Mm-hmm. And there've been people historically have already、mm-hmm. fought and defeated those lies.、Yeah. If you take the time to read and、yes. to learn and to listen,、yeah. uh, in a way, it's like our our minds are so open to hear anything, and then we catch, you know, whatever the trendy phase、yes. of ideology is, and we leave behind just. Common sense, which、yes. is written in the heart, I think, you know, at a very、yeah. deep level,、yeah. and we forget where we came from. Yes, and we forget whose we are too. We forget、totally. that we are gods. And I know we had this discussion earlier, just about, you know, I know you you're in a Catholic tradition, and and for me, I was I was kind of anti-Catholic for a long time, and then, but I my own reasoning started going, okay, wait a second. I'm sitting here with this Bible by myself in an office with some computer software, and believing that I'm going to find the best interpretation of it. Why? Because I'm more intelligent than everyone else. I'm closer to God than everyone.、Else. Like, why would I think that? That me in isolation would come up with truth. It's it's this independent, individualistic world that we live in, versus going back. Well, there was a time when the church was one. And a thousand years ago, we wouldn't have to figure out if you're evangelical or bad. There's no such thing. No one would say, "Hey, where do you go to church?" There's one church,、mm. and there was one council、mm. of leaders. And what did one they, authority? Yeah,、mm. and they all、mm. looked at this book, studied it together, and came up with this is our best understanding. And everyone came under it. And so, to believe that. A thousand years later, when all those guys and their collective wisdom and all those people that were so close to the time of Jesus and his teaching, they're all off because, you know, I went to seminary、mm. and I got the the highest brand of Bible software, and I was in my office for years, you know, studying this, and I've got it. There's an arrogance、mm. to that, and so we have to attach ourselves to these ancient truths, and we have to question. Question like, wait, so civilization, human, they believed all these things for six thousand years, and now we in this generation are going to change all of the rules, and that makes sense to us. Like, it's just challenging my kids to think that through and go, look, mom and dad, I was handed this forty years ago, and I've studied it every day. Loved it. I've been in communion with this God for forty years, and I'm now passing this off、mm-hmm. to you. It's like a baton. It's like 
this has been passed down for 6,000 years, came to me, I've held it for 40 years and I'm gonna hold it till I die, you know, but it's, it's your turn mm. and you've gotta decide, are you going to continue in this tradition mm -hmm. or are you gonna believe your friend mm. or that this generation is the one that finally figured out that everyone was wrong for all of human history? Um, I, I don't care if they all say something. I'm not gonna bet on this generation. I'm not gonna bet on your friend. I'm gonna bet on this body. It's of tradition, yes. right? It's all, that's exactly. it, because it, so live action's non-sectarian, uh -huh. meaning we are, you know, you don't have to be religious at all. And yeah. we are for yeah. you and sharing content. Yeah. Uh, but we have people on the team, Catholic, I'm Catholic, like you mentioned, um, came, became Catholic in college, actually. We've got evangelicals on the team. Uh -huh. We've got Southern Baptists. We've got yeah. the whole yeah. the whole group of them, right? And, but you know, what you're saying is so interesting, because I think what you're speaking to is, you know, the, the historicity of our faith, yeah. that there's, yes. this didn't just, the, the Bible didn't drop from the sky yeah. 40 years ago, and yeah. that's the first, you know, yeah. Yeah. The, the Bible was given to us through, I believe, a church authority, mm -hmm. right, that yes. had authority coming from the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, who had his, who authorized his first yes. 12 who laid on the hands, and yes. that gave them the authority then mm -hmm. to consecrate ultimately, and, and yeah. all of this, consecrate Eucharist, but that authority, I think, is, you know, what happened in the garden, mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. What happened? What was that? What was that first? Mm -hmm. The first sin of the human person, according to our faith, is that yeah. they rejected the authority mm -hmm. of God because of why they they feared or they had this thought they would get more joy outside of the Lord. Yes, right? Yes, I mean, that's really yes. you think your happiness will be found yeah. outside of Him. Yeah. And so that's that first rejection of authority. Yeah, and it was also based upon desire. It's mm -hmm. like. Ooh, that looks very appealing. Of course. Right? Mm. And so I'm going to go for that. And people need to be honest about mm. this. Um, because I see people interpret this book in the craziest ways. Mm. I'm like, okay, really? Is that the most natural reading of that passage? Or is that what you wanted to believe? And because I can make this book say anything, you know, just pull a word from here, a verse from there, and, and come up with your own theology. But what is the the most natural mm. reading of this. And isn't it really your desire? Like you want this to be true because you want it for yourself. And whether it's popularity and this is just mm. what everyone's believing. And so it's very easy to go, yeah, I believe that too. So right now we're facing this crisis. I yeah. mean, there's been more bloodshed in the 20th century mm. than any other century. Mm -hmm. And in the 21st century, the abortion rate today, we're facing 2,500 children in America alone killed every single day. So the leading cause of death, period, is abortion. Mm -hmm. Kills more people than car accidents, cancer, certainly than COVID even during the pandemic. And so, you know, we're Christians in this land, you know, yeah. and we're trying uh, to share the truth and share love, yeah. but there is literally our own brothers and sisters who are being led away to be killed in facilities set up sometimes in the same street as our churches, mm. where they're being torn apart into pieces, dismembered children, you know, through all nine months of pregnancy, it's legal here in mm. California and mm. in states across the country. So this is, there's nothing I can even, you know, I've studied social reform movements and human rights abuses, but we are so desensitized yes. to the extreme bloodshed of our most yes. vulnerable members of society. Yeah. What do we do? What is, what, what is our response? I think one of the biggest crisis, crises in the church is this fear of speaking directly to matters. Okay, so I started ministry in the 90s. And, you know, in the 90s, the morality in the U.S., obviously it's never been biblical, mm -hmm. But it was a lot closer. So you could preach openly about things and be accepted by a large number of people. That's no longer true. Um, certain topics like this, you bring it up and you'll immediately be canceled by a large swath of people. No matter how sensitive you are, they're just against it. 
And so for that reason, you have leaders that are like, well, I just won't address that issue because it's too divisive and I want people to know God. And if I talk about that, then they'll reject me. And, and I. And so it, it kind of baffles my mind. Yeah. Because you look at the writings of St. Paul. Yeah. And he's oh. like calling out if this oh. church is not paying attention on gluttony or sexuality issues. So yeah. He just calls them out. And he says, you have forgotten the oh. teaching, da, da, da. And he like glaze in on them, yeah. right? And I just look at like the today, the abortion rate yeah. is the same yeah. among those who identify as Christian. Yeah. Now, they're not necessarily going to church every Sunday or mass every Sunday if they're Catholic, but who identify as Christian mm. or Catholic as it is among people who don't according to surveys of people who've had abortions. And, you know, I was raised in a beautiful evangelical church. I basically never heard abortion talked about. Mm -hmm. And I went to my youth pastor when I had a realization of what abortion was, and I said, we've got to talk about this, the abortion. Is it? it took a year to persuade him. And finally, wow. you know, we got through. We were able to talk about it mm -hmm. in, the, in the youth group. But it just, <laughs> why? Why when there's lives at risk in our pews sometimes? Well, I think right now, I'm not saying it's right, but pastors are just fighting to keep anyone around. Um, people are dividing over everything. Mm. And so I really feel for ministers today because it's like, well, are you, you know, who did you vote for? Oh, you vote for that guy. OK, we're leaving. You know, are you wearing a mask? I'm leaving. Did you get vaccinated? I'm leaving. Or right, you did go to that BLM rally. OK, no, I'm leaving. Everything is just people are leaving for all sorts of reasons. So I think a lot of them are shell shocked in the thought of, well, why don't I just talk about abortion this week? <laughs> You know, well, it's like pick your battles. Exactly. I'm not saying as a pastor you got to come out there on every political issue. No, no, and there absolutely. are two sides on a lot of political issues totally. that you can reasonably make, yes, even yes, as a yes. Christian. Yeah. But on an issue about whether or not it should be mm -hmm. okay, whether societally or legally, to kill a child in the womb. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't I mean? Don't you think that's kind of baseline? It is. I I personally don't know of leaders who actually believe that it's okay. Um, Meaning you think- Christian leaders. You think most Christian leaders think abortion's wrong, but that isn't- But they won't talk about it. Do you think they really see abortion for what it is? Like, like let's just put it this way. Okay, if yeah, instead yeah, yeah. of it being a pre-born child that's taken into you know, Planned Parenthood and abortion clinics, it was, a one, it was an 18 month old. Yeah. If 18 month olds were being taken in yes. to centers across yes. San Francisco, San Jose, yeah, yeah, yeah. Los Angeles, wherever, yeah and kill 2,500 a day legally. Yeah. Right now, people would be like, I'm against that. But I who knows so. where, well, yeah. yeah. What, but my point is, yeah. who knows where the world's going to where pretty soon we could be desensitized to that. Because it's and silly that, right now, right? Right, but that's it's, where if you don't speak against the child being killed in the womb, and it should be enough to speak against them, Yeah, you're right, we're gonna yeah. get desensitized. So 18 months is okay, but, what about nine months or about three months, you know, and then it's like, okay, right up until conception, you know, or to, you know, the delivery, like it doesn't make sense wherever you draw that line. It's just, it's life. But the longer we think we can play this game of sticking one step ahead of the world, as long as, well, at least I believe that, you know, in the last three months, that's real life. I'm, a, I'm ahead of a lot of people. And I think sometimes as Christians, you almost feel like if I'm a little bit. A little more moral yeah, than everybody yes, else. Yes, yes. I'm good. Exactly. Which is really dangerous. Yeah, rather than. Either I heard this right illustration of like, here's the church, you know, here's the Bible, here's the world. And as the world moves away from the Bible, the Christian is kind of in the middle following the world. Feeling, well, I'm still closer to the Bible than the world is. And but the world's going further and further, and we're 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 running from this book. We're following, but justifying it, saying, "Well, I'm not like them." Yeah, but you're way over here already. Mm -hmm. You know, you you we gravitate away from this book. Well, I think the the Catholics. You know, there's a, yeah. sometimes conversations about it at live action amongst different folks. But I know in friends that I've had, I say, "Well, if it's just a book, yeah, you know, and there's no defined authority." Wow. that helps to teach that book, uh -huh. 
then it's mm-hmm. no wonder you could, because a book, you walk away, you walk towards it. It's the living word of God, but it's living in that there's an authority given to us to help us determine the complexities of each era, because mm-hmm. each era has mm-hmm. its lies and complexities. Yeah. And so I think that's part of the, it's like the the authority question of, yes. you know, and that's why, thanks be to God, you know, the Catholic Church has not changed its teaching Yeah. Yeah. on, on sex, contraception, yes. you know, yes. gender yes. identity, abortion. I have some people say, well, the Catholic Church is going to eventually, yeah. you know, change yeah. its yeah. teaching. Yeah. I was like, hasn't for two thousand years yeah yeah it's not going to yes and i i wrestle with it that's why i wrestle with my evangelical roots because i'm going gosh it really feels like every pastor is his own pope and however he studies and whatever conclusion he comes to he's free to teach his whole congregation that and there is a safety in saying look here's the church tradition here's what they've always taught and that's why even the elders at our church when we come to something that's controversial, we study church history and go, hey, what did the early church fathers? Because even us as a group in the 21st century, I don't know if I completely trust us to come up with the right thing. Let's go back, let's go way back and see what they said and why, and that's important. What do you think pastors should be doing right now? Mm-hmm. If you could talk directly to pastors mm-hmm. who are, you know, trying yes, to do the yes. right thing, but we're living in a bloodbath. Absolutely. And we're also living in yeah. a time when people think, you know, men can be women and women can be men yeah. and little children are being put yeah. on, you know, not even having puberty. Yeah. You know, they're being put on puberty yeah. blockers and, oh. you know, you just hear the most heart-wrenching stories yes. and it's all done in the name of compassion. Yeah. You yes. know, like abortion's yeah. done in the name of compassion. You know, children, little children being uh, prevented from adolescence is being done in the name of uh, yeah. compassion, even mutilation of their body parts yeah. in adolescence being done. So it's all done in the name of compassion. Yeah. And compassion, God is another word for love. Like, you know, mm-hmm. love is a word for God. Yeah. God is God yeah. is love. Yeah. He is compassion. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we want to be compassionate as Christians. Absolutely. Um, but what I would say is, Okay, on January 1st, I'm talking to my 18-year-old daughter. She says, Dad, I'm going to do this 30-day challenge to read through the Bible in 30 days. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. I don't think I've ever, I've never done that in 30 days. I go, I'll join you. And I'm really competitive, so I finished in 14 days. I just read through the Bible, and it was awesome. I go, gosh, why have I waited this long? Just try to, I mean, you can do it in three days. I have friends who have done it out loud in three days, the entire Bible. And it changes your perspective on things. I mean, it's like watching a movie for three minutes a day. You're just going to lose a lot. And in the same way, when I read through the Bible, what hit me the most was I'm reading one prophet after the next. They all sound the same. Mm -hmm. Then you get to Jesus. He sounds just like them, but even deeper, richer, and then then you get the uh, apostles. Everyone sounds the same. They have the same tone, directness, and what when I came to the end of it, I'm like, I don't sound like them. No one sounds like them. And I realized they didn't care how people were going to respond to their teaching. They knew they were going to be rejected. There was a, there wasn't a sense of, oh, I want this person to, I, I want this person to believe. And so they need to stick around and hear my teaching more. They just threw it out there, knowing they'd be rejected, knowing they'd get killed. They just said it. And we, I grew up in a time where we are working so hard on our craft of communication and, okay, start with this story, start, you know, and, and get this because this is how you move someone. And then it's, it's like, this is how you draw a crowd and talk about felt needs, talk about this, you know, relate to, you know, current events, on and on and on. This is how you get people to your gatherings. And pretty soon you're, you're thinking, what do people want to hear and what will turn them off? And that determines what you say. And I'm going, they didn't teach that way. They just said it. And I came to the end of that Bible reading and just said, God, I, I don't want to end like this. There's some of that in me, this people pleasing. I want to be like one of the prophets. So what is it when it comes to abortion? 
What is the it that pastors should just say? That we're going to answer to a holy creator who is the author of life. And we don't have the right to take that away. And we're going to stand before God on a lot of things. And I don't think people realize like a phrase like that, stand before God. Just the word God, the way the Bible describes him. I, I was just teaching out of Hebrews 12, and it says, you have not come to that which may be touched, a blazing fire, darkness, gloom, a tempest, uh, the voice uh, like trumpets that made the hearers beg that no more words be spoken. It's, it's talking about this God who dwells in unapproachable light. Like we don't realize how terrifying that moment, and yet it's the most important second of our existence is when we stand before him, and it's just us and him. And 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 did we make our decisions and did we come up with our beliefs based upon that moment of going, I'm before you, God, and did I value the way you thought and the way you taught that I really make my decisions based upon the things you said and did in history? Or was I swayed by my desires, by what's popular, what the culture was saying? Um, gosh, the Bible says that if you shrink back, Hebrews 10 says, my soul, ah, what it was the exact word? Something about in the time of decision. Yeah. He just says, my soul takes no pleasure in mm. you. Like that's almighty God saying to those who... Well, in Revelations, if you are, you are neither cold yeah. nor hot. Yeah. And I will spit you from my mouth. Yes. It's like, that's intense. Yeah. You are not cold or hot. You're just lukewarm. Meaning I'd rather, it's like the Lord's, I'd rather you reject me passionately and know oh, yeah. why and like yeah. tell me to my face. Oh, yeah. Or obviously love me passionately and seek me. But this lukewarm of like, yeah, oh, yeah. God is good. Da, da, da. I'm going to live my life. Yeah. There's a great book about that. It's called Crazy Love. I heard a guy wrote that. <laughs> I think his okay. name's Fran. Yeah, yeah. Fran Chance. Fran girl's name. <laughs> but uh Hebrews best selling New York Times. Yeah. You can pick it up on Amazon.com. <laughs> uh, Hebrews 10, 38. My righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Those are harsh words. If if we shrink back, he says, My soul has no pleasure in you. That's why I, I admire your boldness, your courage. And there will be many who reject you and hate you for this. Um, but you're falling in line with what the scriptures teach. Jesus himself said, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. And so we've got to stop playing this game of me right now thinking, well, if I say this just right, maybe I can still get everyone to like me. No, if I explain, no, if you kill that life inside of you, you will answer to a holy God one day for that. And out of love, I've got to say, don't do it. There are other options, and this is far bigger than maybe you realize. And it'd be so unloving for me to not say that and just let you come before this God at the end of your life, but also to say to those who have done this, there is forgiveness. Um, his throne is a throne of grace, and we can approach him and receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. And so it's not like if you have committed this act that it's the impardonable sin. 
but you have to humble yourself and admit, God, whether I didn't know or I didn't see, but I see it now when I am so sorry, there is absolute forgiveness for you. Um, but I know, and obviously you know many more people who have committed that sin and found forgiveness in Christ, and yet there are still scars from that, and they're warning others and saying, hey, I mean, how many people have gone through with the killing of their babies and then afterwards just lived with mm. this regret and horror? People who didn't even know God, they mm. just inherently, there is a sense in which he puts a law in our hearts mm. and we just know something isn't inherently perfect, but we scream louder and louder to suppress that. And... Uh, uh, it's it's hard. It's it's hard. I mean, even for me as a Christian, there are some things I was raised with and brought up with that were just off. And it's a battle to fight through those things and saying, oh, that's the way I feel, but this is the way. This Meaning process. impressions you had of who God was yeah. that were, you know, based on how you were raised and even things in your own church community growing up. Yeah. They weren't really true. Yeah, or they were exactly. they were not the fullness of the truth, and so it yeah. could lead you in the wrong direction. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so it's a battle. I want to be mm -hmm. sensitive because some people have been just brought up to believe what's right is letting women make the choice um, because this is not a separate life. It's just an attachment to your body. It's like a tumor or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you were brought up with, just saying, oh, it's not a life. It's not this. Is, like this is ingrained in so many people's minds. This is the prevailing thought. And so I want to be sensitive to that, but also warn people going, gosh, this is, this is very new thinking. Mm -hmm. And it is not biblical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's important to also acknowledge that, you know, some people, if there's coercion, yes, you know, yes. if it was done under duress, like I was uh, interviewing a, a victim of incest who at 14 yeah. years oh. old got pregnant and was forced to have an abortion by her abusive father. And you hear these stories and is that crime on her or is that on him? It's on him, right? And I think that's also, you know, like in Catholic teaching, there takes there's multiple facets of what makes a sin. Yeah. For it to be my sin that I'm culpable for. And yeah. intent has to be one, that I yeah. had to intend to do this mm -hmm. thing. It wasn't an accident, right? Yeah. Uh, that I had to have knowledge that I was doing this thing. Yeah. Uh, that I had consented to do this thing, right? Yeah. And so I think it's true with abortion. And that's where people listening, if they've had abortions um, or been involved in an abortion decision, then you're talking about forgiveness and also recognizing, you know, how much did you know even yeah. in the forgiveness that you're seeking and yeah. and the story that you have now to share about the grief and the pain yes. and the, the regret, that story can save lives. Yeah. So God's not going to waste that wound that you have Yeah. I for, the, for helping other people. You look at the, the story of King David. <laughs> I mean, that, that one baffled me for a while because I... I'm reading and looking at his sin, which was so horrendous. I mean, he used his power, which we hate, to get this woman, you know, and then to sleep with her, and then he impregnates her, and his solution is, well, I'll, I'll try to cover it up and get her with her husband. That didn't work. Let me have her husband killed. Like I know. He basically rapes someone. Oh. Then he kills someone. Yes. Then he's, and he dece he's deceptive about it. Yes. And it bothered and, me because then it just seemed like once he confessed it, and well, he, he was even forced into that confession. I mean, a prophet comes and says, look, I know what you did and lays it all out. He's caught. He repents. And then it's back to life as usual. And I'm like, how did he get back to, you, you know? And But that's the depth of the forgiveness of God. I had to study that because I felt guilty for things I did 40 years ago. And I'm going, why do I still feel a twinge of guilt? Why do I still have this, like, I'm still a little bit dirty in God's eyes. And I started studying Psalm 51 and looking at David, like, how did you bounce back? Because I think there's some people that are so riddled with guilt. And I would say, Look at Psalm 51. Some of the things about David was appealing to God's ability to forgive. And 
He says, if you wash me, I'll be whiter than snow. Interesting. And Jesus, I mean, God promises if you confess your sins, I'll forgive you of your sins and I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And I was telling God, I look at my soul almost like those old dry erase boards <laughs> that you erase them, but you still see a little bit. You know, you can still it's read. A bad marker. Yeah, 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 or whatever. They just don't work right. I think that's how I felt inside. Like I'm clean, but if you look really closely, you can still make out the words and see it. And and so there was still like guilt from the past, um, shame, rather than this belief. Like you know, if God erases it, I'm whiter than snow, and. I just want people to know that and believe that and trust it because it's God's word and it's not intuitive for us to believe we can be forgiven to that extreme. And maybe it's maybe it's because of that that there are some that maybe have felt the guilt of it but still are fighting for their rights mm -hmm. because there's a lack of like, you know, I'm, I can confess this and be completely pure in God's eyes and right in his eyes now, and let me go that direction. Mm. Um, I think a lot of the passion that comes from the pro-abortion side mm. on this, um, you know, just this ferocity mm. of conviction that, you know, it's a woman's yes. right and yes, abortion is yes, a good yes. thing. How dare you even tell me what to do with my body, right? Yeah. That's the language that they use. And I do think at a very deep root, there's fear, of course, mm. the fear of being controlled by people who will harm them and, um, you know, yes. the fear of the new life within. But then there's also, I think, this, you know, running from if they've had an abortion or been involved in, you know, other people's abortions, running from if I come to acknowledge the truth that this was a human being that was murdered how de it's like psychologically and many of these people they they feel a compassion like they're trying to be compassionate mm. there some you know many of them it's just so devastating yeah. to even begin to accept and without the mercy and love of Jesus Christ mm. how can someone deal with that you know the, the pain of knowing oh i i killed my child yeah you know that's extremely heavy stuff yeah. Uh, but the beauty is that, you know, we all have, yeah. we've, we've all fallen short of yeah. God's mercy and love yeah. and his power to save is way bigger yes. than any, the, the very worst thing any soul on this planet has ever done. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the heart of the pro-life message, I believe, is mercy and forgiveness and Ooh. love. And some of our best advocates and the people that are the most effective are people who've had abortions who are willing to courageously share yeah. about that yeah. and tell people, no, don't do this, you know, yeah. um, yeah. and join the pro-life side. Mm. You, you, you know, there, there's a verse that came to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just reading and, and you know how sometimes you read the Bible and you're like, I've read this a hundred times. I never noticed this. Mm -hmm. um, in Hebrews 4, it says, Verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So just that, I'm like, I don't think of God as being able to sympathize with my weaknesses. You know, that's not my natural thought of him. And then it says, who in every respect has been tempted as we are. I don't think of Jesus being tempted in every way, in every respect, just as I am. But, but that's where I have to go against my own intuition and go, no, this is what the Bible says. Like he understands our weakness. He understands our temptation. But then he says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Okay, I've preached about the throne of God hundreds of times. I preach about God's throne more than anyone I know. And it's embarrassing to go, I never realized he called it the throne of grace. Like, that's, that's huge. Like this, this is the throne of grace. So you're this terrifying, consuming fire, and you're telling me to draw near 
to your throne of grace. That's how his, his throne is defined. And for some reason, maybe because my baggage, my background, like there's this sense of, gosh, coming before being that great. It's not, if I saw a blazing fire, a tornado, a, you know, lightning, thunder, fire, my natural inclination is not, I'm going to run into that. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, no, draw near to this throne because it's a throne of grace. That means God saying, this is who I am. I'm a gracious God. Anyone who comes to me, they're going to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So despite what you've done and how many things you've done, he's saying, while you're still on this earth and you still have breath, you can come to my throne. And my throne is a throne of grace. And I think too many people like me, maybe we've missed this. Mm -hmm. And we just think, okay, it's just a terrifying thing to come before the living God, which the Bible also says. Mm -hmm. But he also says, no, if you come to me, I will in no way cast you out. Mm -hmm. And he says, my throne is a throne where I will, this is cut me open and I just mm -hmm. want to give. Mm -hmm. I just want to give you what you don't deserve. You know, this is what he told Moses, you know, the, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Those are the first ways that he describes himself. I, I'm merciful. I'm gracious. Like, I will cleanse you like no one else could cleanse you. I will forgive you and pour out my grace on your life like you wouldn't believe. Mm. And that's what I've found at his throne. I just want other people mm. to understand that's available to mm. you right now whether you feel like it is or not, even though we live in a time where everyone cancels each other for the tiniest things, <laughs> that's not our God. <laughs> our God says, no, you come to my throne, it's a throne of grace. There was this um, young girl in Poland and she named Faustina. Mm -hmm. And she was uh, this young girl named Faustina and she was had these visions of hell mm -hmm. and she had visions of heaven. But she had this vision of all the sin in the world, like the darkest, worst, most heinous crimes all together were like one drop of water being flung into a tremendous furnace. And it was just immediately evaporated, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's sin to God. Wow. Because God is a wow. con consuming fire of love mm -hmm. and all the sin is just gone. Our sin can be gone like that. And that's mm -hmm. the power of God. Wow. Which is so, brings so much hope. Yeah. It brings so much hope. Okay, so we're both from California. Yes. We're in California. You know, I've lived here pretty much my whole life. I've spent yeah. some days on the, or years on the East Coast. You've lived yeah. other countries, yeah. but ultimately we're both back in California. Yeah. 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 Although I sound like you were wanting to stay I overseas, know. but I God brought you back exactly. here for better, for worse. You know, so we're both here. You. We're both yeah. here. And I, you know, dark things are happening here. So Proposition 1 passed last fall. Abortion on demand through all nine months is now enshrined in our state constitution. We have a governor who's literally putting up Bible verses on billboards, encouraging people in other states. He's putting, paying for California dollars to pay for billboards in other people's states, using Bible verses, telling them they can come to California for abortion. That's the maniacal and the confusion of our governor right now, Governor Newsom. Mm -hmm. So we have these, it's just kind of insane in California mm -hmm. right now. And a lot of people are leaving the state. Yeah. But I feel called to be here. You're obviously called to yes. be here right now. What What do we do about the future of the state? Well, I think the first thing is, I, when you're sharing all that, I think about Ezekiel chapter nine. There's this passage where uh, God is talking to Jerusalem and he's, He's talking about all the evil that's going in there and, and uh, that this angel, these angels are going to go and they're going to carry out their judgment on this place. But he says before that, the Lord says to this, this one angel who's clothed in linen, had a writing case. He goes, pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. You know, so he says, okay, before you go and destroy that city, mm -hmm. first I want you to mark the foreheads of those who sigh and groan over the abominations that are committed to it. 
And then after that's all done, he says in verse six, he goes, kill the old men outright, young men, maidens, little children, women, but touch no one on whom there is a mark and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the house. I'm like, wow, that's intense. Well, especially because I know there's the critique. They're talking about killing children there. Oh, but it's God's judgment here. And he's saying, but the thing that should mark us is that we grieve over the things that are an abomination in the sight of God. And do we grieve? Like, not because this bothers me, but because this bothers God. Is your life marked by, God, this bothers you, so it grieves me that this is going on in my state. Um, it's that heart posture. Mm -hmm. And even as I say this, I'm convicted because the things I sometimes spend my emotional energy on maybe aren't the priorities, or I know are not mm -hmm. the priorities. Like some little mm -hmm. thing, oh, car problem, or, you know, or, ah, oh, shoot, you know, the heat went out or the power's out of my house. Mm -hmm. Like they can consume so much of our thoughts mm -hmm. and because we're not thinking of what matters to the Lord mm -hmm. and we're not thinking about these 2,500 who were killed today. Like, are we like those that would be marked because we're grieving over this? And especially those of us who are part of the church and especially those who are the leaders of the church. I just don't see a godly mourning mm. um, in people. You know, we're just, we don't spend the time thinking about this creator God who loves, and here's this child he's knit together. And now the child's life is terminated. And what does God feel about this? And does it grieve us to where God would say, you know what, I'm so sickened by California and so many things going there that are against my word and maybe it is time for judgment. I'm not, I hope the Lord keeps from that because, you know, just being patient a little longer. But aside from that, my question is, is would he look down and see Lila and go, put a mark on her head. She's protected by me because she grieves for the things that grieve my heart. Like, I think that's where it begins is going, you know, we used to sing that Hosanna song, break my heart for what mm. breaks yours. Um, and I think it's taken mm. from passages like this of just, God, do, am I just living my life and the things that bother me or things that just irritate me mm. or do they bother me because they're an abomination in your sight and I'm so close to you that it drives me nuts. I, my wife is far better at this. Um, you know, just grieving, weeping over some of the things our kids were mm -hmm. taught, you know, in public school, just the things they have to face, the th things people are saying. And I don't know, maybe I get calloused or I just get into um, fix it mode. Um, okay, what do we need to do? What do we, you know, and I don't feel the weight of the emotion of God and grieve over these abominations. It's such an important point you're making, mm -hmm. uh, the, the importance of grief yeah. and letting your heart just be rended by it. My first chapter in my book, Fighting for Life, my only one book, not okay. like you, you've written <laughs> so many, but um, is Let Your Heart Break. Mm -hmm. wow. And it was heartbreak for me that inspired me to even start live action. And it still is to this day, in a way, keeps me going, strangely, mm -hmm. because I'm fighting for something beautiful and good but if you're letting yourself still be broken, it compels you to do something. You yeah. can't just sit around. Yeah. If you never weep for those that are being harmed, yeah. it's hard to really fight for them. Yeah. And you know, last year uh, there were these uh, five babies 
that were found, there were actually more than 100, but five of them were nearly full term. And they were found outside a late-term abortionist clinic that Live Action has investigated in Washington, D.C., Cesare Santangelo's abortion clinic. And their bodies were, were given by a whistleblower. They were being sent to an incinerator to be burned. And they were given away to a pro-life activist who went and tried to pursue a proper burial for these children. But five of them were you know, nearly full term, just been totally mangled. You can see th these are babies. These are human beings. And you know, we, we shared the images. So many people and many people were just heartbroken. They wanted mm. to get in the fight. There are some people who said, how dare you? I don't want to see that. Yeah. It's traumatizing. Yeah. And it's like, you don't want to look at what's happening. Yeah. How are we going to stop what's happening? Mm. If you won't even look, mm. if you won't even hear, if you mm. won't even see. Yeah. And I think for the church, for Christians, for pastors, the willingness, I think abortion, we have live action as abortion procedure videos that show wow. through medical animation what happens during mm. the procedures. Mm. I think they should be shown in every church in America. Yeah. So wow. we know what is happening outside of our doors mm. to let the heart be resensitized. Yeah. Amen. I, I just, and I would say to leaders out there, we got to stop playing this game of trying to please everyone. And just say it like it is, because that is our legacy. This is what has been left to us. There have been men and women that have died for the truths in this book. Mm -hmm. And they weren't thinking, will everyone like me? Mm -hmm. And who's going to leave my gathering? Who's going to stop following me? Who's going to cancel me? This is what we signed up for. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for what you're doing and boldly putting these truths out there. And I'm sure I can't imagine the amount of attacks you've gotten and the hate mail and everything else, but I'm just grateful for you as a sister, as a fellow follower of God, that you're holding on to truth and willing to suffer for it. I mean, to go full circle, I mean, that's part of our faith is this isn't going to be easy, but there's this peace which says, you know, my life could end today. I'm not guaranteed another breath. God determines whether he's going to give me another breath. He determines whether I make it through this interview. It's all in his hands. And this could be the end. Mm. This could be the last thing I do. Mm. And I stand before him and I've just got to answer, did I shrink back? Was I afraid? of my reputation or was I more passionate about mm -hmm. this is what our creator teaches and says and he's the author of life and I don't feel any right to take life and none of us should. Hmm. Francis, this has been awesome. Hmm. Is there any other th things on your heart to share? especially to people who are listening, who are trying to stand up for life, stand up for the truth. Yeah. You know, there's a passage that I, I read to my kids on Mount Zion, and I had just noticed it a few weeks before. Uh, in, in Psalm 81, verse 10, it says, I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. And, I, I, and what he's saying, he's saying, I'm the God who said, let there be light. Like when my mouth opened, I said, let there be light, light appeared. He goes, but that wasn't enough. People don't like my words. They don't want to follow the words that come out of my mouth. And so his judgment on them is, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. I'm just going to let them do what they want to do. And his judgment was to follow their own counsels. You don't want to listen to the words of Almighty God. Here's my judgment. I'll make you listen to each other. I'll make you think it's wise to follow someone and care about their opinion because he can throw a football really far or she got great plastic surgery. And so, oh, I'm going to follow and listen to their counsel. That's not wisdom. 
Like that's, that's what God's saying. If you don't care about my words, you know, that, that have been passed on for 6,000 years, it, then I'll make you the type of person that will just listen to other people. And so for those who are trying to hold on and fight for what's right, I'm just telling them, like, we're on the side of 6,000 years of biblical history. Um, and people think our values are old fashioned. And I go, yeah, in fact, they are ancient. And I'd much rather go with that than these new <laughs> thoughts. You got to understand how much is new thinking of this generation and, and to realize, wow, am I really going to ditch all of that? So it was just one of those moments where my kids and I were just like, yes, we are going to hold on to these truths. And, and I'm not the foolish one mm. for holding on to something that has been passed on for so many centuries. I would argue that it's somewhat foolish to go with new thinking that contradicts what mankind has believed for so many years. Um, but we live in a very innovative, creative and uh, time. And I'm just saying, ah, when it comes to morality, God's word has stood for this long. Let's not mm. mess it up. I love that. And I, that's why I love the lives of the saints. You know, we're called mm. to be saints. Yeah. And you look at the lives of the saints, you know, historically, mm. 2,000 years of different yeah. saints, canonized saints. Yeah. And they lived creatively, uniquely yeah. for the gospel, mm. lived and died. Some of them martyred and mm. went singing yes. to their deaths, even yes. some of them. Like yes. the joy of the Lord. How did you get oh. the ability to sing before your little nuns in France, but in the French Revolution, going to get the guillotine and they're singing? Yeah praises to the Lord. Like, how did you get that? And, but they were ultimately united in the faith, yes. in authority under the truth. Yeah. And they had, but the creativity was still there. Yeah. I think we sometimes think, well, to follow the rules or to, yeah. to like, you know, this the ancient truth yes, as you yes, speak yes, about, yes. but that's actually when creativity can most come mm. alive because it's a real creativity mm. yeah. that is based in truth. Mm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's just a joy to stand with those people. Mm. You know, that's the side I'm on <laughs> is with those. I mean, just yesterday before I spoke, this lady got up and she was from Turkey and uh, she just wanted to pray for everyone for yeah. the heart of forgiveness and then explains that her husband was martyred. Wow. And living saint. Oh, She's yeah. She's married to a saint. Yes. <laughs> She's living in heaven. But exactly. It's amazing. And so it was very hard to follow that and go, Wow, but there was such an honor and just like, yeah, I want, I want your faith. I want to be like that. That's the side I want to be on. You didn't shrink back. Your husband didn't shrink back. And I don't want to back off mm. on declaring truth, even if it means my life. Thank you for yeah. being one of those leaders. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> trying with you. Yeah, good. <laughs> Where uh, can people find your work, Francis? Yeah. Uh, go to crazylove.org. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just teachings, resources, hopefully something that's helpful. Thank you so much, Francis. Yeah, totally. This is awesome. Thanks. Thanks.